Welcome to the Take 92 Podcast. My name is Sammy Warmhands. I'm your host. And today I am once again thrilled to welcome one of my favorite bands to the show, Kevin Bavona from The Interrupters. He's worked with everybody from Rancid, Transplants, Less Than Jake, Boss Tones, Sublime, Plus 44, you name it. Even has a Grammy on the shelf. We're going to talk about all that, plus the new album, In the Wild. This is Kevin Bavona. How's that? That's good. That's good. How are you? Good, dude. How you doing? <laughs> Great, man. This is the second time this week where it's been like, uh, how about we just do it today? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> hey, thanks for rolling with the punches. I mean, we're doing it late night style. I like it. Yeah, I, I really don't mind. I'm definitely a night owl too, so... Thank you so much for doing the show. Uh, like I said, a big fan of your band. And that picture I just sent you was from the first time I got to see you guys live. Okay, so any like identifiers in that picture? Because it's a close-up. What show was that? I also found a picture of your back line like right before you went on, but it was at the Analog Cafe in Portland. Okay. I remember that show well. We played downstairs, and the stage was kind of in the corner. Yes. And it was kind of wild because monitors were on like tables like dinner tables and so this there was a stage right yeah and then there was like these three tables like restaurant tables with monitors on them and i remember like no barricade that was a wild one yeah and i'm really grateful that i got to see you guys there in a really small room front row no barricade just like taking it all in you know it was so much fun yeah, that was a super fun show. I think the Vandaloos opened up. Yes. Yeah, wow. Great band. Yes. So you're from Portland? Uh, Eugene, actually. It's about 100 miles. Okay. I have to mention something before I forget, but today you guys were featured in the, the trailer for the new Harley Quinn season three on HBO Max. I was so stoked on that. If you look around behind me, there's probably you could probably count half a dozen Harleys just in this shot alone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of that show. And after the years we've been waiting for the season, the only way to make it even more exciting was to put you guys in it, too. I didn't expect that at all. Were you guys familiar with that show at all, or, or how did you find out about it? I definitely am familiar with the character. And to be honest, I didn't become familiar with that series, like the animated HBO series, until they were interested in using the song. Yeah. And those types of things are always weird because someone reached out to us and said, hey, we'd like to use your song in this trailer. And we're like, yeah, of course. Awesome. And then you just don't hear anything for like yeah. three months. And then one day the trailer comes out and you're like, whoa, it <laughs> happened. Cool. You know? Yeah, that's got to be a trip, man. It's a show that I've reviewed on my other podcast because I have a Batman show as well. And it's just fucking funny. The, the closest thing I could relate it to is like Bill Burr has that Netflix cartoon, F is for Family, where it's just yes. nonstop filthy jokes. It's, it's like that, but in like a supervillain world, you know? Yeah, definitely going to be checking it out now. You know, we had our song Take Back the Power in a trailer for Shameless. Oh, five, yeah. I love that years show. Years ago. And I wasn't aware of that show. And then I became addicted to that show just because I saw the trailer and I was like, I want to watch this show. And so it's kind of a cool, weird roundabout way of discovering shows and stuff. But yeah, that's who's amazing. Your favorite um, Batman. Who's my favorite Batman? Yeah. Michael Keaton. I grew up on that. You know, it's kind Same. of my first movie memory of seeing that when I was four years old. And I got to meet him a few years back at a Comic Con in Texas. So, no way. yeah, it was like his only con appearance, like ever. And so I just booked the ticket immediately. Yeah, it was super cool. So I got I got like a picture of us over there, kind of out of frame. And a, and a, uh, actually, I don't know if you can see the picture of him behind me, but that's the autograph I got from Batman Returns. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, I was obsessed with those particular Batman movies when I was younger. And Tim Burton in general. I was a big Tim Burton guy. Because yeah, and Danny Elfman. Like like, he's just killing it. Beetlejuice, you know, the Batmans, Edward Scissorhands, like all of that. I was a huge, huge fan of. Yeah, massive, massive. And, and through a, a roundabout way, one of the longest running friendships I've ever had was through a musician I worked with who was also into Batman. And we wound up bonding over that. And I was like, yo, you should chop up the soundtrack, the Danny Elfman soundtrack. Uh, cause he made beats and I was like, and I'll rap on it. And we, to this day, make music after 14 years or something. So, um, dude, that's so rad. I think too, you know, I wasn't really playing music when I was discovering those movies, but something about 
the Danny Elfman scores and the Danny Elfman soundtracks always spoke to me to the point where like, by the time I was a teenager, if I watched a movie and it was like a Danny Elfman score, I could tell, I was like, Oh, that's Danny Elfman. And like, what a great, I mean, talent and just outside the box, just all vibe and just so rad. I'm a huge fan of him too. Well, I have so much to talk about with the band, but first I have to mention you are an accomplished musician and producer in your own right. I jotted down just a couple of things. Is it true that one could say Grammy Award winner Kevin Bavona? Yes, I have a Grammy statue in the house. Yeah, that was uh, talk about being in the right place at the right time. I mean, in 2011, Tim Armstrong got in the studio with Jimmy Cliff and just started working on music. And I was lucky enough to be working with him. And, you know, we went in the studio, did a couple songs. I was playing in the band. I was playing, like, piano and additional guitar, and I was doing some engineering. And I mixed a couple of the tracks. I mixed, like, Ruby Soho and Guns of Brixton. And then I think their chemistry was so good that, you know, I think it was within a couple months, Jimmy had reached back out to Tim and said, I want to do a whole record. Nice. And then a few months later, we go back in the studio with the intention of doing this album. And we were in the studio with Jimmy for, like, a month. And Tim was producing and talk about like watching because I grew up a huge Rancid fan as well. You yeah. know what I mean? And a huge fan of Tim as a songwriter and a producer and everything he does. And also Jimmy Cliff. So I'm watching two of my heroes collaborate <laughs> and like being able to, oh, I have an idea for a piano part on that song. Or I have an idea for a guitar part on that song. and really being able to do it. And then it's one of the only records that I've worked on that I still, we put it on all the time. Like in the dressing room, we play it when we go on tour. That's playing between bands. It's such a great record. I'm so proud to be a part of that. So grateful to have been a part of that. But yeah, then it won Best Reggae Album at the Grammys in 2012. But since I engineered and I mixed on it, I got a statue because there's an engineer and producer's wing of the Grammys that gives statues to not just the artists, but to some of the people involved in the production. So yeah. That's incredible, I man. It. Honestly, I grew up more in like the punk, ska, 90s stuff, so I wasn't that familiar with Jimmy Cliff and some of the reggae legends. But when I played the album in, in prep for this, I was like, oh, I can hear the correlation with like a poet's life and some of Tim's solo stuff. Like it definitely has that, that sort of vibe. Like you can hear his stamp on it. A lot of the same musicians, too. You got Scott Abels on drums, who played on A Poet's Life, Jay Bonner on bass, obviously Tim on guitar. And, you know, those guys are reggae scholars, like, you know, to the year, to the studio, to the instrument. They know, like, every single thing played on those records. And I think that was a cool thing for Jimmy, too, because it kind of brought him back to, like, where he started in a way, sonically, but also recording-wise. We did everything live. Nice. There were some tracks on that record that Jimmy was literally on the other side of the glass singing while we were playing the the rhythm. Oh, yeah, I saw a clip of that on YouTube where Tim was talking about that. Yeah, sure enough, it just shows him fucking singing live with the band. That's so rare. Yeah, man, what a, what a talent. So to uh, skim over a couple of amazing things before we get to the band, you played on the last couple Rancid records, you were on the recent Boss Tones album. It was a Hellcat release. I was surprised to learn you had credits on other albums in my collection. Sublime with Rome. Oh, yeah. Plus 44. Were these other bands that you also grew up listening to in addition to Rancid? Oh, yeah. I mean, being from Southern California, Sublime was huge. I mean, I'd be lying if I said that that wasn't my first, like, when Wrong Way was a hit song, you know, I was oh. really young and like that was my first introduction to ska, yeah. really. And I still think too, when I listen, you know, I've become such a fan over the years of like all the different eras of ska, but when the way I play ska guitar is probably more like Bradley Knoll than anything else because I just remember that's how I learned to play it, you know? Yeah. Um, th- that's why I have a little more edge on my tone than like some of the bands that had maybe a cleaner rhythm guitar. But yeah, I mean, and then playing on the Sublime with Rome record, that was again, just being in the right place at the right time because this was in 2011. I had gone on tour with them as a drum tech and they were looking for a female background vocalist to do some vocals on some songs. I just hit them up. I said, I heard you're looking and they said, come to Texas. So 
They fly her out to Texas. Oh, wow. So you actually went out to Paul Leary's place. Yeah. So Paul Leary was producing. The studio was this rad studio called Sonic Ranch. And, and that was another thing. Paul Working with Paul Leary was pretty rad. But I went there. I bought my own flight just as, like, Amy's support. But next thing you know, like, I'm in the studio. She does her vocals. And they had a track pulled up. I think it was Take It or Leave It. And I was like, I'll throw organ on this right now. And Paul Leary's like, all right, give it a go. And I did it. One take, made a mistake. The mistake's on the record. Huh? And then I remember, like, we were kind of partying pretty hard that night. And Paul Leary was like, what time you guys fly out? I was like, we're leaving for the airport at, like, noon. And he goes, can you wake up and just come in at 10 and throw a bunch of organ on a bunch of stuff? Wow. And I was like, sure. So I woke up early, super hungover, and I just went in there. And he just started pulling up tracks. And I just did organ bubbles and pads. And that was a really cool opportunity because I wasn't even supposed to be there. That's really, amazing, you know I mean? man. Like Bud Gaw is one of my all time favorite drummers. And I remember when that came out, he was in like modern drummer or something like that. And he talked about the recording of it. And he's like, yeah, it was cool. I've got my acoustic kit integrated with the electronic pads. We did nothing to a click. Everything on that record you hear is me first take live. And yeah. it just feels like the band. And I'm like, God, that's why it sounds just like the 96 record. You know, like it just has that fucking live energy. Like it's so amazing that you got to be part of that and do it the same way. Like, let's just fucking go in first take and everything. A hundred percent. And Bud is such a great drummer, like criminally underrated. Yeah. His hi-hat technique is insane. So Sublime with Rome got back together. I got a call because I used to do so much tech work and roadie stuff. You know what I mean? Through the years. And, uh, that was one of the calls I got where like everything was easy. He was so chill. I just set up his drums, tuned them, made them sound good. And, and like you said, like he had the pads integrated. So he had a sampler that had like all of his like samples and he would just get up there and play. And it was so like low maintenance and chill, but like watching him play and just sitting behind him every day, I was like, yeah, he's one of one. I don't know anyone else that plays like that. Like yeah. he just like the way his hand came back to crack the snare and the way he would stop everything almost every time he hit the snare was pretty, pretty insane. Yeah. His combination of swing and power and his sticking on his hi-hat, like it's got this funk thing about it, but it's so original, man. I just, I could talk about him for too long on the plus 44 record. Did you get to work with Jerry Finn? You know what? I didn't. That was a really quick, interesting session. So the way I came into this whole world of like being involved with Rancid and Blink and Plus 44 and all those bands was when I was 18, I was playing in a band and our guitar player had just quit because he got a job at like a management company. He ju we had just literally just graduated high school. Yeah. So he's probably like 19 or 20. He was a little older than me got a job at this management company and told the transplants manager at the time said, we're looking for a keyboard player. Do you know anyone? He goes, I know someone gave him my number and I got the call and all it said on the message was we're looking for a keyboard player to go on the work tour. And I, for, you know what? I never really considered myself a keyboard player. So like I didn't actually call back. And then I saw him like five days later and he goes, Hey, did you ever call my friend about that gig? And I was like, I don't know. I'm not really a keyboard player. And he goes, dude, it's the transplants. And I was a big Transplants fan. Like when their first record came out, I saw oh, them yeah. three times on their first tour. Yeah. I went up to Fresno, saw them twice in LA. Anyways, I couldn't pick up the phone fast enough. I called back. They're like, what are you doing this week? You can audition like on Tuesday or whatever. So like I auditioned for the Transplants. I think they had one other guy auditioning. It was a crazy day. And I got the gig, long story short. Rehearsed with them. We're about to go on the Warp Tour. But like three days into transplants rehearsal i had known these guys like five minutes i get a call from the manager that's like travis wants you to come to the studio and play on his other band cool you know i didn't really know what plus 44 was doing i wasn't aware it was pretty it's so early on in the process that like they hadn't really announced anything so like yeah i grabbed my keyboard and i drove to i think it was henson studios in hollywood walked in and mark hoppus is just right there <laughs> and he's like on the phone so i can't even say hi but i was just like I'm the keyboard guy, kind of, you know? <laughs> and I went in there and they were working on a track called Make You Smile. And I just went in there and played some piano on it. And I didn't get to work with Jerry Finn. I met him in passing a few times in that era, but that's another band and record that's super important to me because 
when they went on tour, I became Shane's guitar tech and I did all of the touring they ever did. Cool. And that record is so good. They made such a great, timeless record. The songs are so good. The recording's so good. And it's one of those things where when I hear that record, it just brings me back to a time. It was just wild. I grew up playing music and listening to all these bands and then to be like able to work with them. It was just mind blowing, but it was cool because I played keyboard and then I went out as their tech. So like I got to see, I got to see both sides of a lot of the world. I always just wanted to be around music. Yeah. So if it meant I went to get everyone coffee, that's what I would do. If it meant I was tuning guitars, I would do that. If it meant I could play keyboard on a song, you know? So that was, that was just that time in my life and joining the transplants. You know, my dad's a recording engineer and had a Pro Tools rig at the house. So when the transplants asked if I could be their keyboard player and like they have all these samples on their record, how am I going to get it across live? Yeah. I said, well, if you give me your stems, I could literally take them to my house, chop them up and put them on my keyboard. And they were like, oh, that sounds awesome. That's easy. I was eight months out of high school. They were, wow. I, I remember at the audition, they're like, have you ever been on tour before? And I said, my band drove down to San Diego for a show once. <laughs> that was, you know, that was yeah. it. Yeah. And thank God I got that gig because it led to everything else that I'm doing up to this day, you know? So when you were out with the transplants, let me cross-check something here because I never got to see them. I was a fan from the first album, but I never got to see them until they did this tour with Rancid in 2013. I just looked it up while we were talking. They didn't come to Oregon. They came to the Showbox in Seattle, and it was one of the greatest oh, shows yeah. that I've ever seen. Played like fucking 12 songs from Outcome the Wolves, and Transplants killed it, and every anyway. Were you on that tour? Do you remember? Yeah. I was playing bass at that time. Okay. So when I joined in 2005, I was playing keys and running samples. By 2013, when they got back together, I was playing bass on that tour. And then I had a piano off to the side. Matt Freeman would come up and play bass on Diamonds and Guns, and I'd play the piano. Yeah. But if you were at that Showbox show, they did two nights. Oh. I don't know if you know that. One night, Noise opened up, amazing, like, street punk oi band but the second night interrupters opened up and that was interrupters <sighs> first tour ever oh my god so no i played in all three bands on that leg i would play guitar in interrupters bass in transplants and then i'd play keys in rancid on a couple songs but that was like the first interrupters tour and i remember that seattle show very vividly because it was very hectic figuring out how to get my band up to seattle to do these shows in a rental minivan <laughs> while I was on a tour bus with the other band. Yeah. You know, but I did roll in the minivan with them for most of the tour just to keep it real. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, that's awesome, <laughs> man. Like to. how wild that I've thought I saw you twice. Now I've seen you three times. That's interesting. <laughs> Another producer, before we get into the interrupters, you have done some records with Rancid. What has been your experience with Brett Gurowitz as a producer? I mean, there's another dude right there that I grew up listening to the records he produced because Alcone the Wolves, Let's Go, Rancid 5. I mean, he's had a hand in every Rancid record. Yeah. And being a musical dude and being into punk rock at a young age and just absorbing everything, I remember hearing like Rib by No Effects and hearing like, those dudes do like it was like Brett and I I don't know maybe Jay Bentley or like one of the other Bad Religion guys doing like the Oz and listening to Bad Religion and so like I've always loved the Beach Boys and the Beatles and these harmony bands yep you know so Bad Religion to me was the punk rock Beach Boys in a way because how smart and effective their background vocals were but also how beautiful and just it pulls at the heartstrings you know what I mean yeah so huge fan of Brett the first time I really met him so we made the first interrupters like record and tim took us in and he and he, he's like hey i got a new band i'm signing to hellcat he goes you guys gotta meet brett and we went out to thai food and i remember we like wore our suits i don't know why we wore <laughs> suits to the thai restaurant I, th I thought it was like just to be memorable or whatever yeah but uh yeah he was so cool but like i i was so intimidated you know what i mean and we played him a couple interrupter songs at the office. And I remember him saying, who makes this? And it was just, it wasn't mixed yet. I, it was my roughs. And yeah. I was like, oh, I did. And he goes, wow, man, drums sound great. And I was just like, whoa, cool. that's nuts. <laughs> so then shortly thereafter, Rancid's getting together to do Honors All We Know. And Brett's producing it. And I got hired to be the engineer for that record. And nice. It was really cool because 
the way they did that record was like they went into a practice space and literally jammed and wrote these songs. Like Tim would bring in a song, show it to the dudes, they jam it, work out parts. And my job at that time is I brought like a mobile studio to record their jams. And my job was to record the jam, do a quick mix and send it to Brett so he could send feedback and notes. What a fucking and we life. Did that for like maybe a week or two. And then we went in the studio. And once we went in the studio, that was the first time I really worked with Brett. Yeah. Man, the thing about him is like, I had so much to learn. So I was super quiet and I kept my mouth shut. I remember early on him asking me like, oh, well, what mic would you put on this instrument? Or like, how would you do the overheads and stuff like that? And I'd be like, well, I would do it like this, but I would love to know what you think. And like, he just knows so much about gear, so much about recording. And he has such a simple approach to everything. Like no frills, like he knows how to get a sound and he knows like what's effective. And he was like, the first dude to teach me about running two separate mono reverbs, one to the left side, one to the right side to give you a wider spread rather than using like a stereo plug in like stuff like that old school stuff that like I carry with me to this day. I, that might've been a little too audio nerdy for the podcast. No, but. not at all. That's why I'm asking you about a list of producers. Cause that's like where my head is at. Yeah. I mean, I'm such a fan of producers and mixers and I'm always trying to absorb as many techniques as possible because I think any producer and mixer, most of them, they always can get better. And I always feel like I have more to learn and I try to learn as much as possible and just always just trust my ear. And I think that was another thing Brett liked about me because when we would be working on stuff, I would always try to be mixing as I go and get it to sound like a record. So like when we're listening, it's more exciting in the studio and yeah, and stuff like that. That was an amazing experience. And now I've, I've known Brett now for almost a decade and he's been a mentor on these Interrupters records and worked on multiple Rancid records with him and always talking shop. And he's he's been a huge supporter of us too and love that dude. And same with Tim, you know, like, I've been very lucky to be around because it's not just like they're great producers, but they're also producers that I grew up admiring, Yeah, which is like pretty cool and crazy. I mean, it's, it's wild. Sometimes I feel like Forrest Gump, like shaking hands with the president. Like it's just bizarre how life has kind of turned out in those ways. You know, I really, really do get it, man. It's a surreal experience when you get to work with these legends that you grew up listening to. I mean, you're describing a moment early on in Honor is All We Know where you're recording Rancid's practice space jams, doing a rough mix, cutting it, sending it to Mr. Brett. I mean, are you taking that in at that moment going like, this is fucking crazy? I mean, uh, honestly, yes, hindsight is it's even crazier. But at the time, I just remember wanting to do a good job and not let anyone down. Because a, a theme of my career has always been like the first time I do something, it's like the biggest time. So I had never done anything like that. But now I'm doing it at a high level with Rancid. So it's like, yeah, all I could do is mess this up. I want to be reliable. I want it to be dependable. I think part of it is because ever since I was young, I've always looked way younger than I am. And people have always looked at me like a child, pretty much. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I think I built up a complex of like, they're not going to think I'm good because I look like a little kid. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. I've been recording bands since I was 14 years old. It's all I've ever done. But I still get that imposter thing where like I get a gig and I'm like, oh no, what if they find out I'm a fraud? Kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know. I know a couple people that have that too, but it's hard to be in the moment and really... I don't want to say appreciate because I've always appreciated, but it's hard to be in the moment and really see the weight of what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, especially when you're making a record. Like it's not until I have the record like in my hand and I'm holding the vinyl and I'm like, Oh my gosh, like I can't believe I did that. And then it's a beautiful thing too, to revisit these records. Cause that record came out in 2013. And I remember I had like a plane ride or, or a bus ride, something like within the last two years. And I was like, I'm going to put on honors all we know. Cause in my memory, like, I mixed it, you know what I mean? And I'm like, oh, I wonder what my 2013 mix sounds like, you know? Oh, yeah. gosh. And then I listen to it, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, actually, these songs are so good, and the performances are so good. My mix is fine. It holds up, and it sounds like Rancid, the band I love, and I'm yeah. so honored that I got to work on it. So I end up being able to get, like, a new appreciation for these things, you know? 
I'll tell you, this may or may not be interesting to you, but when that record came out, I was planning to go get it later that day, and my mom shows up at my house, and she goes, hey, I was just at the record store. I saw they had a new Rancid album. I bought one for me and one for you. I'm like, what? Whoa. <laughs> because I had How got, cool is your mom? I had got her into uh, Out Come the Wolves, because you know, she doesn't like the harder edge stuff like I do, but you know, I've got her into Less Than Jake and Goldfinger and you know shit like that. So I was like, oh, you like this shit like Time Bomb. You've heard that song on the radio. It's like, yeah. And so she bought yeah. that record for both of us. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, Out Come the Wolves is like a, such a, it transcends genre. It's like one of the most punk rock records of all time. The songs are so good that like, it's just, to me, it's such a classic record and it's of its time, but it's also timeless. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Like you put it on now and it doesn't sound, you're not like, Ooh, this sounds old. You're like, this sounds amazing. Yeah. You know, it's just, and then that that's another, you know, Jerry Finn, Andy Wallace, Brett Gerowitz, Rancid. I mean, like, I mean, obviously that combination of people is going to make a great sounding record, but yeah. Yeah. If uh, one was to go back in the take 92 podcast, there are other Jerry Finn, Andy Wallace, Mr. Brett stories to the other guests that I've had on here, because those are names that I grew up seeing on the back covers and going, Oh, he did this one. And that, you know, like in that, just following that totally. journey and, and recognizing like what kind of sounds, you're drawn to as an artist and as a young producer, you know? Yeah. And you know what? That's why I still love and obsess over album credits. I yeah. mean, it's not as prevalent as it would have been like in the nineties because a lot of people consume music digitally, but there has been, you know, a resurgence of vinyl and people buying vinyl. And I think it's so important to have those credits in there because that's how I learned what to listen to and what I liked. Yeah. And, just seeing those names on the sleeve. It's not quite a lost art, but it's definitely getting fewer and further between. Yeah. But I always make sure when we're doing Interrupters records, like we work on the credits and we make sure every little thing is there. You know what I mean? Well, let's shift gears a moment. We'll use that to transition into the band because there's so much. I mean, you guys haven't even been around that long comparatively, and there is so much to talk about. I was introduced to you guys with the song Family featuring Tim Armstrong, like a lot of people were. It had been a while, it seemed, since he had broken a new band, and so I was very interested of like, oh, what is this? You talked a little bit about some of the ways that you got in, just as a roadie and some of those other gigs. What was your relationship like with Tim and the band at that time? Like co-writing, production, trying to launch this new project. I mean, how did he guide that for you? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. At that time, I was working on so much music. We were making a Transplants record. I was engineering at Travis's studio, and I was also engineering at Tim's studio. So, you know, me and Tim would leave, like, a Transplant session and go to his house and work on, like, stuff, you know, he was producing or his solo stuff. And then at a certain time, right before the Interrupters, he was doing this project called Rock and Roll Theater, which was this awesome, it was like a musical that he had written all the music for. He had, like, directed this, like, stage show kind of thing that they shot on a soundstage, and it was, like, dancers, and the songs were really dope, though, and I got to be involved with the recording of that. It was, like, I remember it was such a cool, exciting time because he was so fired up, and he'd written these songs. I remember him hitting me up and being, like, do you know some musicians that could, like, demo out these songs with me? So I called a couple friends. We go in the studio with him and he would just, we did it so punk rock, dude. He would just play us the song one time. We'd kind of figure it out. <laughs> and then we would just run takes and be like, okay, take three was the one. And then he'd go in there and do the vocal. I had no idea what he was building at the time, but he was building this like, it was a musical. It was like probably, I, mean, I don't know, maybe like a half hour, 40 minutes had a story, but the songs told the story. And next thing you know, he's getting tracks back and it's like, Lars was the lead in the musical, so Lars's uh -huh. vocals on there, and then Davy Havoc played the devil in the musical, and then Davy Havoc's vocals on there, and then like we're adding piano and horns and strings and just like building this whole thing up. And that was really the beginning of me working on music with him in that capacity. And at the time, Amy and I were working on a record that was going to be a solo record for her. So we met on tour in like 2009, and I watched her set, and I was like, man. Her songs are so good and her voice is so good. Holy shit, what a songwriter. And yeah. like, I have to work with her. And I remember just talking to her after we did like maybe like six shows together on this tour. By the first show, I was like, yo, 
we got it. We exchanged CDs and we exchanged numbers. And like after the shows, we would go our separate ways. And then I'd like listen to her record and text her like, oh, this song is so good. Oh my gosh. And then she would text me back. Oh, I'm listening to your record too. This song is so good. And we'd be like, we got to write together one day, you know? So right around that same time, her and I started writing together. And the first week we wrote together, we didn't have a direction. She was just like, I'm going to make another solo record eventually. I just want to like write some songs. She came to LA. We got together. We wrote Easy On You, Gave You Everything, a song called Wander, and the beginning of In The Mirror. And this is like the first what? week we were together. Oh my yeah, God. So then we start working on this solo record and I get like my brothers and some friends. So simultaneously, I remember I went to a show with Tim one night. We went to like a place in Silver Lake, Spaceland. And we went, we went to see my friend's band. We were in the car and he's like, you got anything you've been working on? And I just play him Gave You Everything. Yeah. But it was the original demo of Gave You Everything. It was like acoustic with like a drum machine kind of thing. And he goes, whoa, dude, this is really dope. I'd love to write with her too. And I was like, she'd wow. freak out if, you, if I told her that. So I remember I saw her after the show that night and I was like, Tim Armstrong wants to write with you. She's like, what? And we, so we get in the studio. So I'm working on all this music with Tim and then I'm working on this record with Amy. Tim's involved as a songwriter. And when I f was getting to the finish line of the record with Amy, we had like 10 songs mixed, pretty much done. She was kind of like, yo, like I've been a solo artist for a minute. I grew up playing bands and like, I want to be in a band again. Like it's too much. It's just like, I don't want it to be me. I want it to be like us. And yeah. I was like, let's start a band. And then the twins had played on the record and helped out. And I remember just calling them up and being like, do you guys want to be in a band with Amy and me? And they were like, okay, <laughs> you know, Amy and I had like a vision. We were like, we're going for it. And the twins were just kind of like, I think they were like 19 or 20. And they just were like, yeah, whatever, we'll, we'll do it. And uh, we came up with the band name, The Interrupters. And then like, the long story longer to answer your question. <laughs> I remember playing Tim some tracks and being like, so this is actually not going to be any solo record. It's going to be a band called the interrupters with me, her and the twins. And he goes, "Whoa, hold on. You guys are starting a band now. He goes, now you're speaking my language kind of thing. You yeah. know? And then he goes, I want to like meet up with you guys and talk about music. And we were like, okay, he had a spot in LA that we, we met up with him and it was close enough to his house to where he walked there. And I remember showing up and he goes as i was walking to this um meeting with you guys i just came up with this song in my head it represents everything that you guys are about and i just want to play it for you and he just goes this is my family <laughs> and he had the hook and we were like holy yeah this is awesome dude like let's do it so we played him we had a bunch of songs that we had written so we had family and then we had written like you know haven't seen the last of me easy on you friend like me so we had this batch of songs. Let me ask you, though. Do those songs sound like a totally different thing when you produce them for Amy's record? Or do they have enough of the same bones? So all of the chords and melodies and lyrics were there. And it was like one of those things where, like, haven't seen the last of me. Originally, it was almost like a London Calling beat. Like, dun, 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 dun. Okay. But once we started, like... We, we kind of landed on this ska rhythm when we all jammed together because we, we were like, we had we'd done this song, Wander, it's like a rock steady song. Easy On You was more reggae, like halftime. So we start, we kind of like landed on this rhythm that felt good. And we just kind of started, as we're jamming acoustically, playing all the songs at this certain tempo, just because like we're all excited. Yeah. And we're all on acoustic guitar. So Justin's got an acoustic bass and we're just working out like the beginnings of what's the first record is going to be at that point. Like we had a lot of it written, but we actually didn't know what it was going to sound like until we went in the studio. And like a week later we, we go into the studio because at that point, Tim was like, I want to produce you guys. I like believe in this. And like, I, I think we could put this out on Hellcat and it could be really cool for you guys. And we wow. were like, dude, dream come true. Yeah. So like we go in the studio in like, dude, like I didn't even have an amp. I remember being like, <laughs> getting in the studio and being like, what kind of amp do you have? And Justin used this, and we just dialed our tones to like what we liked as individuals. We didn't have a, like a, this collective idea of the sound. And then we sat down. I remember the first song we tracked was Friend Like Me. Demos or album tracks? No, this is album. We, wow. we never, the demos for the record was an Apple laptop on 
what's that called? Photo booth. Oh and we would God. make video and we would make videos and it was like Tim on guitar, me on guitar, Justin on bass, Jesse with a drum pad and Amy singing. Wow. And you couldn't see anything. Like you just saw the wall. It looked like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was just like a wall and us documenting like and being like, okay, that's that's gonna be good enough for that one. Did this one need a bridge? What chords should we do for the bridge? And literally just bouncing ideas back and forth until we're like, we have enough of a song here. But I remember the first day we went in the studio, we started we did friend like me it was interesting because we had written these songs on acoustic guitar and then we go in and do it and and the sound of that first record is really the sound of us in this one room for like we did it in like i want to say we we had like two days booked in that studio maybe because i remember doing like a full day and then the next day we were like it was i mean like the second day we had I remember Amy goes, hey, do you want to do that one song? I don't remember what song it was. I can't remember. We had another song that we hadn't recorded. And I go, I don't want to do that song. That song's White Noise. And then Tim Ah. had a guitar and he just goes, White Noise. And we're like, (laughs) yeah. And we all grab our guitars and we're like, okay, now we have a new song called White Noise. Fuck. So there was these really beautiful creative moments in making that first record of like not really having direction, but having like this feeling that we were following and this emotion in the studio. And so basically we made the majority of that first record in two days, we go to do vocals and then it was like the holidays and we took some time off. And once we were like in off time, we had some kind of like reflection time. That's when Amy and I wrote, take back the power, um, Liberty. And then we decided we wanted to cover judge not and treat the youth right by Jimmy Cliff and Bob Marley respectively. And, um, we had another song called Control that was on Say It Out Loud. We recorded for the first record. It didn't make it on the first record. So we then we booked studio time in a different studio. We went back and we recorded, like, Take Back the Power. I remember, like, we wrote Take Back the Power. We demoed it in our apartment at the time. And I, I, I took it to Tim and I was like, hey, Amy and I wrote this song. Well, what do you think? And I just played it for him. He heard the first chorus and he goes, that's the first song on your record. Oh, yeah. We're like, dope. You know? Yeah. So like it was this really exciting thing, but realistically we did that record and like if you had a stopwatch every time we were working, probably like five days, but over the course of almost a year, you know? I'm gonna tell you why this is upsetting. Because in my notes, I wrote that this album is unbelievably good for a debut album. Like it's one of those that sounds like and this is why I asked that question in the way that I did. Because it, it seemed to me like this was some kind of development deal with Tim. Like you guys had been workshopping and throwing out all these bad ideas to come up with these amazing ones. You know, like, like gradually getting to this point. Because think about all the classic bands in this genre that we've talked about. Boss Tones, Rancid, Less Than Jake. None of their first albums were their fully realized sound in the way that yours is like that's That's nuts funny to hear you say that because when i hear our first album i hear it takes me back to that time in my life and it's really exciting but it's really a band figuring out their sound our second album is us like trying to develop and hone in on a sound our third album is us finally knowing who we are kind of i don't know if that makes sense that's how that's at least that's how i feel and obviously music is all subjective no i mean you you guys have a very clear evolution between albums but i think and maybe you're too close to it but when that came out i'm like commenting and dming hellcat on every platform like why the fuck did you not release this the format that I've bought all the other Hellcat albums from? Please put this out on CD. I want this album so bad. And they finally did. But I was obsessed with it before I even heard the whole thing. Like it was it was just to me it's a perfect album. I mean Oh, you, dude, thank you. I mean, that means a lot. Do you, I mean, another funny thing about that record is like we did it at this studio and then we did Tim had a studio like in his house at the time and like we would go there and do vocals like late at night, but then we would take the hard drive to the twins apartment in North Hollywood. They lived on like the second floor of this apartment and all the gang vocals on that record we did in their living room <laughs> and their neighbor would get a broom and just <laughs> hit the ceiling. Just like, cha, cha, cha. and just, we bombed out those neighbors so much, but it's so funny because like 
since then, vocally, the twins and I have like learned a lot and yeah. like, gotten better at singing, just from touring and just learning different techniques and stuff. But I remember at that time doing some of those background vocals. Like I hear those back now and I'm like, ooh, I can't believe we thought that was okay. But there is like a charm to it too that I I recognize and I'm like, but it's it's so funny just like because you know like when you make music you could get that like perfectionist thing and yeah. like and then we'd have our friends like the twins roommate at the time one of my best friends in the world kenny was there and we'd be like hey sing this ah on judge not with us so we'd be like ah like all together our friend johnny came over and sang and that was kind of like we never lost that vibe anytime we're making a record and we have gang vocals we call our friends come sing with us but when we were making that record it was like we would just do exactly what needed to be done to like move on to the next thing you know we never overthought it i mean that's that's <sighs> It's it's incredible. I, I I'm really in awe that that is the real story of what happened. I mean, you you mentioned the first song. If I just say in conversation to my wife, "Hey, uh, what's your plan for tomorrow?" or if she says to me, "The other one will just finish the line," it was like it in, oh, just in conversation. That's how fucking ingrained in me in us that album is like. I, I was walking around telling everybody, like, best new band, listen to this right now. And the fact it just came so naturally for you guys, that's that's amazing and speaks to your chemistry as a band. Um, we're fucking taking more time than I wanted to, so I want to... I got time, by the way, so you know, okay. I don't know how long these cool. usually go for, but... So the second album, Say It Out Loud, uh, as someone whose own nickname is Anti-Fun, I had so much fun finally getting to see you guys at that show at the analog and taking that picture with Amy after the set, you can see it in my face. Like as an adult, I haven't been able to just like cut loose and feel that way that you feel like when you're 13 and going to a show and seeing a band, you know, like there's just such an energy about your guys shows. And I feel like the second record captured it even better. Like you said, you know, like you didn't really change the sound, but it, like, there's so much heart in it. Thank you. We do put a lot of heart in everything we do. And honestly, to speak to what you're saying, we, when we played our first show, it was in 2012. So we had already recorded the first record before we played a show. So yeah. we recorded, and we had all toured before and played in bands, but, like, the Interrupter's very first show was October 2012, which was, like, a year after we recorded <laughs> the first record. The first record didn't come out until 2014, but Say It Out Loud, we had been on tour... 2013 2014 started recording it in 2015 while touring like yeah. so we were figuring out our live sound and when i hear that record i realized because when we used to play shows we played everything so fast yeah. so say it out loud is fast yeah. everything is like super fast on that record. i love it i love it like my band writes songs that are fucking 30 seconds long super fast so like the energy on that album is amazing and the songwriting too, like you can hear the evolution, like some of my favorites, like on the turntable or my, my personal favorite, I told you this offline, but she got arrested is a phenomenal like storytelling song. Do you remember the origins of that? Yeah. I mean, again, like every song has kind of a different way they come about. But she got arrested was one when we were doing pre-production, be like Amy, me and Tim at first just like kind of like throwing song ideas back and forth and she got arrested was one that like tim had like this piece of he didn't know if it was a verse or a course and when i heard the initial like seed of it i we watched so much dateline i heard, <laughs> i saw the whole story in my head like yeah. already so like sat down amy wrote these like kind of like rapid fire verse things and we kind of got together and like the story it's like kind of like played out fantasy of somebody who was a victim of domestic violence yeah. kind of thing. But it was kind of to shine a light on that too, because it's something that Amy's dealt with and she's talked about it a little bit, but growing up in a house where there's violence and kind of like the fantasy of like, well, what if, and you know, those lyrics still, he was a stranger, put his hands on her in anger. Like there's a lot of them that like, we, cause we sing obviously that song in our shows every night. It's yeah. like, I still love, that one too and it never gets old because it is some of my favorite style of songwriting is the storytelling yeah and you know i was we were amy and i were talking the other day and she's like it's funny you know like 
on this record, I'm telling my story, but she's like, but like on the second record, I was telling my story, but through the lens of someone else. Yes. Got, like to, uh, I'm telling a story about someone. Through characters, I mean? yeah. And that's kind of how she used to process, you know, what she had gone through is like, for example, like Jenny Drinks. I was like, going to say that. Like, that song was about her. Yeah. But she made it Jenny Drinks just so she could scream at the top of her lungs, the world just ain't ready for a spirit like me. You yeah. know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. it's kind of like, and that that's the thing with the new record is like kind of shedding all that and just being make it, making it really personal. But but yeah, she got arrested, turntable. There's some songs on Say It Out Loud that like are s- still very, I mean, every song we've ever done is like yeah. near and dear to us. But like, I know what you mean. And um, yeah, that one was, Dude, there was a there was a point in that song where there was like a whole skit in the middle where like the, oh, wow. the courtroom gasped and we took it all out because it made it kind of goofy. Well, you but, had uh, that a little bit in family, like police open up, you know. And, yes, and that works perfectly for that song. Yeah, but we did the same thing and she got arrested where it went like she refused to plead insanity, and then there's like all rise, oh. guilty. <laughs> She got arrested, and it was like, uh, no, nah, this song's a little too serious subject That's funny. matter for that. But yeah, That's it was funny, funny man. because it was Dicky Barrett was the judge too. Oh we man, like, That's great. Yeah, he went when well, he went murder in the first degree, and then there was a gavel. <laughs> Damn, and then she got arrested. He was on the song Prosecutor, right? Or what's the name of that song? Yeah, Prosecutor. So that same day he came in to do that vocal, we were like, because we weren't sure that the skit was gonna work, and I, 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 we had him there. You know, this is like. Also, we had just toured with them. This was like super early on. And like, we're like, we got to get him on a track. So like we had him sing the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. And you could hear him pretty loud in there if you listen to that song. But yeah. Yeah. And then we had. You had the Less Than Jake guys on a song on that record. Oh, yeah. That was another thing. They were playing. We were playing the same festival in Southern California. And their hotel was a mile from our house. And we called them over and we said, we're working on a new record. Will you guys come over? And they just came to the house. Next thing you know, they're harmonizing. There's horns happening. It was, it was wild. It's awesome. Just hearing you talk about the way the song came together with uh, She Got Arrested, hearing you tell it, it reminds me a little bit of what Tarantino does, sort of like with Inglorious Bastards or Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where it's sort of like the way it should have gone, you know? <laughs> it's sort of like a revisionist history justice story, you know? Oh, exactly. And that was the thing is like, we've seen so many stories of, of that kind of stuff happen through the years. Just yeah. telling a story like that was, I know, really important to Amy and just, uh, and, and having kind of no real resolution in the storytelling, because at the end of the day, th- she got murdered in the first degree because she refused to plead insanity. You know, it's like, it's, I don't know. It's just one of those, like, at the end, you're just like, ah. I did a, like a kind of Johnny Cash acoustic version of that song, and I, I slightly changed the lyric because I said, he lost the fight. You could say she won because, you know, ultimately she's alive to tell the story, but still she did get locked up. Yeah, yeah. And convicted. Totally. I mean, nobody wins in that yeah. situation, you know yeah. what I mean? But that's the fun thing about songwriting is being able to kind of like express these emotions and tell these stories and have that kind of like yearning feeling throughout i guess yeah now we talked about lesson jake i listened to you i think a couple times on the chris the makes podcast uh chris from lesson oh, jake yeah. has a great show if nobody's heard it where he he breaks down every bit of a hit song just oh, the, the whole bit. dna and it's it's really interesting to hear but you said on that show that fight the good fight had a release date before you even hit the studio like there was okay this is coming out in june we're gonna start in January, and it was just happening. Is that correct, that you guys were just, like, on a timeline to drop this between tours? Yes. Yeah, it was. And we had it was such a crazy, amazing touring year in 2017. We went out. We That was the first time we had toured with Green Day. They took us to Europe, Australia, South America. We did a headline tour in the midst of all that, and we were kind of... I broke my arm on stage on that tour. It was wild. Oh. And I remember getting back and in, in the end of 2017, we had done like some pre-production. We went in the studio and just kind of demoed some songs, but I don't want to like be too self disparaging, but we have a tendency to push everything to the last minute. And I'm not saying we like that. It just happens. 
So it was one of those things where the holidays happened and we had this, we had the release date in January, right? They're like, your record's going to come out mid to the end of June. You're going to go on the warp tour. Cause we had the warp tour offer. Cause that was booked like eight months out. You know what I mean? So we're like, okay, we're going to put out the record, start the warp tour. Now we have to make the record, you know? So luckily we had, I feel like in order to like have the confidence to make a record, you need to have like only like three songs that you really believe in. What? And if you do the work, the rest of the stuff will kind of fall into place. You oh know what my I mean? God. That's wild. That's wild. I mean, we had demos of Kerosene, Title Holder. We had Leap of Faith, Rumor the View. We had a lot of songs demo, but like, again, you know, Amy and I made that solo record in 2010. Easy on You went on the first record, yeah. you know? And we're always looking for, like, homes for the other songs. Like, when we made Say It Out Loud, we were like, none of those songs really fit on this record. And then when we were making Fight the Good Fight, at the very end of recording that record, we were like, dude, gave you everything. It's time. You mm. know what I mean? That's one of my favorites, man. Thank you. Not mine, too. It's one of mine. Dude, that's Amy at her finest as a songwriter. Like, I love that. It's just every part of that song is so catchy to me. The verses and the, the chorus and just all of it. And, but making Fight the Good Fight was really fun because we did it on analog tape because it's like, if you're already running against the clock, why not make it take a little longer, you know? <laughs> so when you talked about on the Chris the Mix show that, yeah, we did that one to tape and, you know, she's kerosene, we used some scratch vocals, you know, we brought our mobile recording rig on tour to finish some of the overdubs and stuff. I'm like, wait, are you fucking kidding? Because that... That one sounds like the big budget we fucking labored over this thing and got everything no, just right. Dude, like kerosene, the chorus, when Amy sings, I'm a match, all the way through the chorus, is her scratch. She's on the other side of the glass. If you solo her vocal, you hear the drums bleeding through the wall. It's Jimmy Cliff. But she sang it so good, and we had already demoed it, so like she knew it. I remember kerosene was like take two, because we knew it so well. We did it to tape, and when you get to take three on tape, the engineer goes, do you want to record over that or do you want yeah. to change reels? So we were moving pretty quick as far as like that goes. I think what you're hearing, what you might call slick or whatever, is Tom Lord Algae mixed it. And yeah. He's just a legendary mixer. And he brought this whole new perspective to it and kind of brought out a little more of the bells and whistles that were kind of always in there with our background vocals and our Hammond organs and all that stuff. It just kind of pushed all that stuff a little more forward. And I loved that, too, because as a mix nerd, I got to go to Miami for a week and sit and not sleep for a whole week while he mixed our record because we were wow. up against a serious deadline, you know? That's great. You got to actually hang out and do that with him. Yes, it was out of necessity because we had 10 days to get the record mixed, and we only had, like, three songs mixed. I flew out there. He mixed, like, around the clock to the point where when it came time to do it... So when you mix a record... You mix the songs, but you have to deliver instrumentals, acapellas, and some kind of stem versions of songs, like alternate mixes, like a vocal up or vocal down. So when you get to mastering, if you're like, ah, oh, this is squashing the vocal, we should use the vocal up, you know, just stuff like that. He taught me how to use his console, and he'd go to bed at like two in the morning, and then I'd stay up and I'd print the stems. Nice. Because... I didn't want him to have to do all that stuff. We were running against the clock. I remember he's like, I'm flying to Japan in 10 days. And he's he basically told me, like, if I don't finish this record, I'll finish it in April when I get back. And I was like, that's not an option for us. We <laughs> yeah. have to finish this, you know? Yeah. And we did. That's incredible, man. You had mentioned the tours with Green Day. I wanted to ask about the song Broken World. I know that Billy sort of gave you guys the shell of that song, I guess. And, and you guys took it from yeah. there. How, how did that happen? So we were just backstage. We played Columbia. And one of the coolest things about that South America run is they had their own plane for the band and crew. And somehow, I have no idea how, we weaseled our way onto their plane. So we got to fly on their plane every night. Nice. And basically, you know, you'd play the show. You'd wait around until like 3 in the morning just hanging out. And then you'd go to the airport. You'd fly. You'd land at like 6, 7 a.m., sleep till noon or whatever, and then go play the next show. But it was one of those nights where we were waiting to go to the airport and Amy and I were hanging out and he, he's like, you know, I, I have this riff and this song idea that I kind of wanted to just show you guys. And if you dig it, like, it's yours, basically. It was a different feel. It wasn't as straight. He was like, -na 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 -na. 
and he just started playing it and then he's like and then i got this chord progression he was like la 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 and he kind of had the melody of the course with that chord change la, 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 la. no lyrics and he just kind of did that and amy pulled out her phone and she goes can i record that like in, as a voice memo so he sang it one time and we went back and when we were working on fight the good fight I had two studios going because we were working at the studio working on the record and then i had a rig at home that i would be like doing edits and busy work overdub stuff but we would also be demoing new ideas like yeah. for the late comer songs like rumors and gossip and broken world and we demoed out broken world like you know drum machine just laid it down kind of like amy already had the lyric from the bottom of our hearts to the top of our lungs like she had all that stuff which i loved because i love like bottom top like i love yeah. like that kind of juxtaposition the verses took a minute though that was one of those songs where we like wrote 10 verses and we were like what's the best one because it's like it was such a small part of the song but it was so i felt like it was so important and my original like concept it was more like rapid fire and then amy started singing this melody like the and it was just so much more hooky yeah i love that part and then it was one of those things where we finished it and then i sent it to billy and i was like i hope that he likes it i wanted it to be really good like i didn't want to send him some like half-baked demo or anything like we recorded it mixed it yeah. mastered it and then i sent it to him and just waited for a response and he texted back oh my gosh i love it this is so great and he goes i think this might be the first ska song i've ever like been a part of we we're like whoa dude that's so dope and, that's awesome and it's still in our set to this day and we love that song yeah it's a great song i i wondered what he gave you guys and and if it went through sort of a a revision process to kind of give it the ska remix yeah no i mean and that's Something we always do is we try every song idea in every feel that we think of. Like if we could try it as a mid-tempo punk song, we'll try it as a fast punk song, we'll try it as a ska song. Sometimes we'll try it as a reggae song. It kind of depends. And then we'll all kind of agree at the end of where That's it good. land. I was in a band as the bass player once. We would play a song one way for six months, and then like the night before a gig, he'd be like, all right, so we're going to do it Americana style tomorrow. I was like, whoa, 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 what? And I fucking hated that shit because to me, like we just spent all the time ironing out the kinks, you know? So I think it's great that you guys are going from the get-go, A, B, and C, where do we want to take it, you know? Yeah. I mean, we've done last minute things though. Like that song on Fight the Good Fight, Outrage was like a kind of cow pump. And then like, I don't remember how it happened, but we were just in the studio. We all had our instruments on. We just sped up the click track and then we started playing it really straight and it felt like kind of like bad religion. And we were like, oh, this is cool. Let's just try it like this. And then yeah. it just became the song. That's you know? cool. I have to mention the closer, Room with a View. It's very powerful. I had lost a friend right around the time that that album came out. An, an old co-worker named Bill, who was kind of a mentor to me, you know, he died unexpectedly, he left behind his wife and his kids, and that the lyrics in that song really affected me, and I, I would put on that album a lot and think of him when, when I played that song. So I bring that up only to say, you guys write it with your own intention and what it means to you, but that it meant a lot to me as well. Oh, that means a lot to hear that, man. I'm sorry about your friend, man. That sucks. I wrote that for my friend Mark, who passed away in 2007. And then, you know, the idea of the song was like, the grief is one of those things that it never goes away. Yep. You know, he was in my friend group from like high school to like now even. And it, that song is just about the just like wondering, there's a lyric, it's been 10 years without you and all your friends have aged. It's yeah. like, everyone's getting older and then watching his family grow. And it's just like, just that hole in your heart of like, oh, I wonder what it would be like if you were here. And that was another song that was demoed before. And there's a couple times like where I'll write a song on some like George Harrison side guy thing and Amy will hear it and be like, no, that's an interrupter song. I didn't write it for the interrupters. I just wrote it, demoed it. And she goes, no, that's an interrupter song. Same thing with like The Valley. So there's those moments, but that song means a lot to us too because it's, you know... Grief is one of those things that it's just impossible to process. No matter how old you get, no matter how much time goes by, there's still that hole and it just, it's, it's rough. I think what's interesting about it is, like you said, that perspective of time going by and it's sort of talking about 
the rest of us and where are we now? And I couldn't help but see like his kids in that, in that future you're describing. That song is about like as spiritually connected as I can feel. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you know what that lyric is, is like when we all get together and we talk about, you know, Mark, we're talking about how much we loved him and all of our great memories with him. And to me, that's heaven too, you know, like yeah. being held in this light of like the good times and stuff. And the funny thing about him was he was a huge Rancid fan when we were in high school, super punk dude, played bass. When he passed away, we went to his parents' house and they had like a barbecue and they had some of his stuff like laid out in his room, some t-shirts, some studded belts some things. And I remember like there was a fedora there and it wouldn't fit on anyone's head except mine. So I was like, okay, I'll take the fedora. Cut forward to 2013. We're shooting the family video in our backyard. Oh. And Tim showed up in a suit. We we're about to start shooting. And he goes, you don't happen to have like a fedora or something. And I'm like, I do grab the fedora, give it to him. He's wearing Mark's fedora in the family video. And it's like, if I would go back in time and tell Mark, Hey, Tim Armstrong's going to wear your hat one day in a video. He'd be like, you gotta be kidding me. You know, like, so that was a beautiful full circle moment. That is to, the greatest. People can't see this, but I'm grinning ear to ear. Like that was amazing. I can't believe that. Yeah. And that's the type of stuff that like music is so important and people, it connects so many of us and it's a bonding tool. Like when you're young, and you have no life experience, what do you and your friends have in common? Yeah. The music you listen to, you know what I mean? Or skateboarding or whatever movies you like. It uh, starts there, but the thing is, is it penetrates so deep that it does last a lifetime. Oh, yeah. You know, that love music. All of my relationships started with music, for sure. So the next drop was the live album, Live in Tokyo. Yes. That was the first time we ever played in Japan at... Two in the afternoon on the second stage at Summer Sonic. There was an accompanying film that you guys released online. I was wondering, like, how come there wasn't like a bundle where we got to buy the album and the and the movie together? Because I thought it was really good. You know, the movie's available for free on on YouTube. It's uh, called This Is My Family. Yeah. We just wanted to make it available for everybody. A lot of people were also during the pandemic were discovering us for the first time and we're like, we don't know when shows are going to come back. So it would be great to have like a live Interrupters concert experience like available yeah. to the people, you know? Good timing, good and, timing. Uh, and that show was just one of those things. We played that show. We walked off stage. We're like, can you believe that show? <laughs> and we somehow got a hold of the video that they shot of us. Like that was just like them we didn't edit that that was just like how they edited it for oh wow because it was broadcast on tv there which was wild cool so that's great yeah I, I collect you know live dvds and stuff so i thought that was super cool project the next speaking of films thing that uh, you guys did around that time you were in uh my friend taylor morden's pick it up oh yeah sky in the 90s that that was really cool to see you guys in there um we talked about this record and out come the wolves and if you can see this, Tim signed it to my oh, brother awesome. Sam the day that you guys were interviewed there. Taylor got that for me. So, Oh, awesome. Dude, that's crazy. He says hi, by the way. I told him that you were going to be on uh, the show. I watched his blockbuster movie, and I loved it. And I was like watching it, and oh, I was great. like, there's something about this that seems familiar. I didn't, I didn't put it together until the end when the credits, and I was like, oh, my God, dude, that makes so much sense. But, yeah. That's awesome. Were you at Back to the Beach when Pick It Up premiered or anything? I didn't make it to any premieres, okay. but we played Back to the Beach, the first one. But I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't get to see it in theaters, but I did get to get a digital copy and I watched it. Cool. It was, it was awesome. Awesome. He wanted to uh, ask about the Operation Ivy get together. Yeah, that was wild. I mean, it was already wild because we were backing up the specials and Tim, and it was one of those things that right place, right time, like we were talking about earlier, just... yeah. Tim hit us up and he's like, hey, I'm going to do, because, you know, that charity does events. They're called Muzak and they do fundraising events, like, I think every year. And we've done a couple of them as the Interrupters and backing different artists. We backed Rhoda Dakar at one. We backed Lynn Vall and Horace at one. We backed Tim at one. And it was, okay, Terry Hall, Horace, and the specials are coming. Can we back them? And I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then as we're rehearsing for that, which was surreal enough, we find out Jesse Michaels is going to be there and he's down to sing sound system. So like we'd been covering sound system for the better part of a decade. Yeah. So we knew it. 
but once that night came and it actually happened, we were we were all just out of our bodies. I mean, that was a pretty special moment. I know there's a lot of videos online, yeah, but you can't quite capture the energy of what was happening in that backyard in that moment in a video. It was otherworldly. It was so awesome. Hearing those two dudes sing together too and go back and forth was just after so many years. You want to hear? Yeah, man. You know that's great. So I appreciate you indulging me on all the history. In the Wild is the new record. You have a sole producer credit this time. Very exciting. I've had guests talk about being mentored and working with a producer, whether that's Ryan Green or Bill Stevenson or, or in your case, Tim. And at a certain point getting to, I'm going to try this thing on my own, take all the things that I've learned and run with it. Was that a discussion or was it something that kind of I just mean, happened? You guys just start yeah, working? And making the record was a discussion because it was going to be two weeks of a lockdown. We were supposed to kind of start making the record before all of that. We were actually in the studio the day we got the news that Tom Hanks got COVID. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was like we didn't know what was going to happen. And then once everything locked down, we shifted all our energy into the live record and the movie because we were kind of like – we don't know when concerts are going to come back. We don't know when we're going to go back on tour. And then finally, when it was time, like we had that burning feeling of like, we got to do this record. Every, the world was still locked down and we had all been quarantining together and we decided to turn our practice space in the back into like a studio. It's a 10 by 20 room. And we decided to make this record. And some of the songs that we had worked on before the pandemic with Tim made it on the record you know i spoke to him and i was bit like basically like we have to make this record we're gonna do it at home we're locked down and he was like dude some of those songs we wrote before if it fits and we were like absolutely of course there's a song that we had started there's a couple songs on that it totally was one of those things it's like they say like necessity is the mother of invention like with yeah. our necessity was like the only way we could make a record is if we're completely isolated to ourselves and you know as the producer I have had enough experience recording with my band to like know kind of like where we were going, what we wanted to sound like, but also to listen to them and kind of like let it happen because the vision for this record started taking shape. Before we make any record, we just get all of our song ideas we've ever had. And yeah. We put them in a list. So we had like 80 song ideas. Holy for this record. shit. We do a green, yellow, red rating system. Green is like, in the mirror was green because we were like, it's done. It's written. Red is like, oh, that's a cool course idea. But like, it doesn't have a song. And yellow is like, this is good, but we need to like, you know, like almost like a traffic light. Yeah. We narrowed it down to like 40. Then we go in the back room with the twins. We jam wow. them out. And then automatically some of them are just like, ah, it's not working. It's not working. We get it down to like 22 songs. And then we realize it's like Amy's telling her life story. And the song, some of the songs are just so personal this time that we kind of shed away all the songs that didn't kind of fit with that concept. So as we were doing it, we really felt like we were in the wild. That's why we, we got that album title. I mean, it's also a lyric in the song Raised by Wolves, but it was such a learning and we grew so much in the process. But like her bringing this particular collection of songs made me and the twins so like we just wanted each song to be as good as it could be. So we like really we all put our egos to the side and we're just like what can we do to make this song the best version of itself this song and that is why it might be more stylistically diverse than we've done before like that's why yeah. there's some reggae on there that's why there's some songs six eight feel and a ballad you know what i mean like yes we just got out of the way of the song this time because fourth record kind of now or never let's try it all and and just the uncertainty of the world, it was just like the one thing we were certain of was like, let's just do the best we can do and not worry about how it turns out. Let's just let it be what it wants to be. And when we're happy with it, it's done, you know? So Yeah, and you, you can hear that, the diversity. I pointed out a few of the songs here in my notes, but the first thing that I noticed, and I think this probably goes hand in hand with what you're talking about of like, okay, we picked these songs because this is telling her personal story, but the vocals are front and center on this record. Like it, it very much feels like we built all this around the lyric. Is that fair to say? A hundred percent. And not only that, I would say as the engineer and producer, like recording her vocals on this one was very special because 
you know how we talked about like recording when you already have a release date and it's like this and that. The, her, the way she approached doing vocals on this record was really interesting. It was all kind of rooted in emotion. So it's like, well, tonight I feel like singing Raised by Wolves. And she's in the headspace of singing Raised by Wolves. And yeah. then 11 o'clock rolls around. We're not in the studio yet, midnight. At 1 o'clock, if she's like, okay, I'm ready. I'm like, okay, cool. And we just walk back there. So that having that kind of freedom of like not really being on a schedule or, or having a deadline or anything really made it so when you're listening to her vocal performance, she's really in the moment and in the emotion of that song and that lyric. Yeah. And there were times when we tried to make plans of like, okay, tomorrow we'll do vocals for this song. And then tomorrow rolls around. We print up the lyrics. We go back there and she's like, I don't really feel this one today. And we're like, okay, well, let's watch a movie or let's do this one. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. very like, she's in an emotional headspace and I hear it in the performances so much. And I feel like, that, like what you're talking about, the vocals being front and center is like, yeah, we built it around this like storytelling and just the emotion of what is being said. And as a producer, like when we make records, it's like she does one take and we're just like, dude, that's it. And then she'll be like, ah, let me try another. So just stay out of her way, you know, and let her yeah. do her thing. And like, it was a real joy to be able to record her in that way where she was just really in the moment. She's an amazing singer, always brings a smile to my face. But there's a lot in what you're saying. I built up this room into a studio space in 2005. And after so many years, I, I can't imagine, like I don't even understand as a vocalist how you just say, okay, on Thursday the 8th, I'm going to go in at 8 o'clock and do my best vocal performance of these songs or whatever. Like I, I don't function that way. Like I, you know, I've been on my yeah. own for so long that it's like, okay, I'm fucking really feeling charged up about x y and z so let's go do that stuff right now you know dude you're a hundred percent right and that's why when you listen to like people's demos they're so good because yeah. they're just in the moment and they just wrote this thing and they just did it there's been many times we've cut demos and then like go in the studio to make the record and been like let's just fly the vocals from like jenny drinks her mm -hmm. vocal on say it out loud is from the demo jenny So there's a song on this record called Alien. It's the very last song on the record. And her vocals, up until the drums come in, are all from the demo. Because it was such a, like an emotional moment when she did that vocal. We just couldn't beat it. And I don't fit. I'm struggling. I'm trying to be one of them. And I'm an alien right here. Being a personal record, I don't think that's any clearer than, than that last song, Alien. I mean, the music is very, very sparse. The lyrics are front and center. It's one of those old school, like, shuffle kind of beats that we talked about yeah, with yeah. the 6'8". Beautiful accompaniment with the vocals. I mean, it's a risky song for the band, but again, fourth record, like, we're bought in. We're ready, you know, and it, it really pays off. Oh, man, thank you. And, you know, that song definitely went through so many stages at one point it was six minutes long and had a wow. guitar solo and like i think i got in that song's way a lot and <laughs> i credit amy having a really clear vision and a love for leonard cohen and also towards the finishing stages of that song tim armstrong and brett gerwitz we did a session together and we just kind of stripped it back and you know getting out of the song's way kind of thing and the very first time i heard her sing it she had it and then I'm like, it's got to be like, dude, I don't know if I was trying to do Queen or what I was trying to do, but yeah. I was just like getting in its way. And then at the very end, it was like, I, we took off all the guitar. I played a track of piano. We got a cellist to do some cello. And, and it sounds so, dude, I feel like so pretentious. Like, yeah, hey, we got a cellist to do cello. But that's what it needed. And then the vocal just popped right through and there was no guitar getting in the way and it was exactly what the song needed to be and again you filled out a you lot know? of the instrumentation though with voice because it is kind of a departure musically but because so many of your songs and particularly on this album are built around the gang singing what you do with yeah. harmony and counter melody in this is still tied to interrupters even though it doesn't sound anything like it guitar and bass wise you know oh man thank you you know i definitely like through touring and playing live i did realize in the process 
before making this record, like if the four of us are playing together, if Amy's singing, I'm playing guitar, Jesse's playing drums, Justin's playing bass, it's going to sound like the interrupters. Yeah. And we don't have to have it a certain tempo or a certain style. It's just, especially with her voice, it, t- it ties the whole thing together. And Alien's a good example of that because even the earliest demo of Alien sounded to me like an interrupter song. And it was, you know, and it was slowed down, you know, six, eight, ballad. And yeah. So let me throw out a couple other uh, songs that really stood out to me because I-, I appreciate you sending it to me. It was very exciting to hear this shit before it's even out yet. Kiss the ground, grab my attention right away. Sometimes when you know, you gotta kiss the ground. Yeah. Sometimes when you know, you gotta kiss the ground. Yeah. We talked about Sublime. It's got sort of the Sublime dub reggae infused sort of groove to it, but a really great melody that that's very interrupters at the same time. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, Sublime was heavily influenced by a, a reggae artist um, named Barrington Levy. Yeah. And what he was doing in the 80s kind of informed the production of that song. But that was one of those songs that, like, we were just locked in the house for so long. And I was just playing guitar one day, and she sang that whole chorus and just had the whole thing. And it wanted to be a reggae song. It didn't want to yeah. be, like, I'm sure we tried it, Scott. But, like, it just felt so good when we were playing it at that tempo, you know? My heart. And though it's painful, I let you go. My heart keeps beating. My heart. Sounds like it could have been a 50s record that you guys covered or something. It was the first time you hear that sort of 6-8 shuffle, the, yes. the Beach Boys backing vocals, but... Without seeing any of the credits, I imagine this is uh, an original Interrupters piece. Yeah, no, it definitely is. And that's one of those songs that, again, you know, when we were in the process of writing, I remember her, she had that chorus, my heart keeps beat, and she used to just sing it around the house. And one day I was like, okay, hold on, I want to sit down and, like, learn what the chord progression is. So I sat down and she's singing it. And it was very, like, 50s, 60s, you know, that, that kind of feeling. And... Again, when we got in the studio to do it, it was like, you know, let's try a song in 6-8. And I remember my first instinct being in this band, I was like, I'm going to put the heaviest guitar tone possible <laughs> on it and go, da na 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 Then I did it, and then it was like taken away from like the vocal, and I was like, I don't need the heaviest guitar tone. So then I just went clean, and I just played as hard as I could, like Joe Strummer, and that worked for the song better. And then it, that song wanted those Beach Boys harmonies. and yeah. Again, it was like my biggest role was staying out of everyone's way. And her vocal on that song in particular, like the thing I love about it is, I mean, it was a really, really personal song for us because, you know, she got a German Shepherd wolf puppy when the puppy was three months old. And that was Daisy and had Daisy for 13 years. And it was like her service animal and helped her with everything, took her everywhere, was like, gave her a purpose like I'd never seen a bond before and and getting to know Daisy and love her and how smart she was and what a big part of our life she was she's in the family video losing her was so hard and so hard to watch Amy go through like even more so because it was such a big part of her identity yes you know they're just like best pals and I think anyone out there that's raised a pet and had that loss they they know it It's, it's it's a weird one because it's just like you know you only have this limited time with them, but I do know that when she wrote that song, it was like kind of a simple to the point kind of grief, but like you hear the verses, she's very singing really low and just really somber. And then it kind of explodes into this whole thing because it just shows like both sides of like, I don't know, that bittersweet thing we were talking about earlier. Yeah. It was the only way we could really get that song across was to keep it in that style. It just felt right. And, you know, one of my favorite punk rock bands of all times, the Ramones. And if you look at the Ramones, they're doing a lot of girl group style stuff. Like, they're very big Spectre fans. Obviously, working with him years later. But that was kind of us doing Phil Spectre, Interrupters kind of thing. Yeah, it totally works. Um, Talking a little bit about instrumentation, I know that for a while, Billy from Real Big Fish was playing with you guys, 
and I'm hearing cool like organ things on songs like Burdens and things like that. And I'm wondering, is that you or is he still playing with you guys or is he touring only or how does that work? So he tours with us and plays the Hammond and stuff, but we brought him out on this record and he does all the trombone. He sang background vocals. He might have even played. I do have memories of him playing organ on some stuff. There might have been like we fired up a couple tracks and had him play organ on. But for the most part, I did most of the keys. There's a couple songs where like sometimes I'll tap Justin in and say, hey, you want to do piano skanks on In the Mirror or whatever, and he'll do it, because nice. we've always kind of switched off with, like, rhythms and stuff. But, like, most leads on keys and stuff, I'll do. We talked about the variety on this album a little bit, and I think the sequencing is very interesting, because it starts out as more of a driving rock record, and then we have sort of some slower ska reggae and the shuffles and then it finishes really strong and upbeat like the song afterthought it's like a straight yeah. punk song for example and that feels like it could have come from say it out loud or something how many versions of this once you you know narrow down the songs and you start actually recording them before you came up with this flow because it it's really hard when you have that kind of variety of styles yeah, I mean, it is. And we, usually what we do is everybody makes their own playlist. I'll make one. Jesse makes one. Justin makes one. Amy makes one. We'll agree on the meat and potatoes the most. But this was Amy's last one, her sequence. Yeah. And since it was her story, we kind of felt like keep it in the order she wants to keep it. And it felt like it flowed really well to us. The only thing that we ever like nickel and dime is like, ooh, what's the end of side A and the beginning of side B? And like, yeah, it worked out well on this one. I, oh, you know what it is? Side B starts with my heart. Oh, okay. So, so when you flip the record over, it starts with the heartbeat, the boom, boom, boom. And yeah, we thought that was really cool. So you guys are out supporting the record with Flogging Molly. I have to ask, did you guys actually get COVID the first day of tour? Yes. Oh, my Dude, God. it was devastating. And honestly, we had a good run, a good streak of not getting it. But, you know, we had a talk before the tour of like, if it happens, it doesn't mean we're defeated because if you literally open up your phone and look at social media, every band is getting it. And it's just like, obviously, the safety of the tour and the fans. And you have so many people out there with the crew and everything. And, you know, if you have people that are really sick and symptomatic, like, you just can't do it. And also, you don't know when you can get back. So you're kind of like going, taking it day to day. And yeah. we just did our best. And we got back out there. And, man... That first show back, did it feel good to be back? Awesome. It was just like such a bummer to missing shows. Nobody wants to do that. It's the worst feeling ever. What has been the response from crowds hearing the new songs? Like how, how much of the new stuff are you playing? We're playing Mirror. We're playing Jailbird. We're playing Anything Was Better. And it's pretty awesome because you could definitely see like there's songs that we've had for a long time, like Take Back the Power, yeah. A Friend Like Me, that people full body respond to then you get to the new ones and you're almost more engaged but less expressive if that makes sense yeah but the response has been actually really great and it's fun getting out there and like getting used to playing the new songs and making them fit into the set and like becoming a part of us you know because it's just growing the whole thing's growing and i love playing the new stuff well, congrats on the new record. It's a huge milestone, not just for the band, but for you personally. I hope everyone goes out, catches you guys on the Floggy Molly tour. Dude, yes. And thank you so much for your love and support through the years. And thanks for having me, dude. It was super fun talking. All right, that is our show. Huge thanks to Kevin for coming on and breaking down these records with me. There is truly no greater joy for me on this podcast than talking with producers about how the shit was made. I haven't asked this in a while, but I think we're running a quality show here. If you like it, give us a five-star rating and subscribe. I appreciate that. I'm going to play you out with a brand new song from The Interrupter's new album, In the Wild. It's my favorite track, Raised by Wolves. 